Uh, my name is Nick Schatz, and I'm one of the pastors here and excited to teach from that text. So thanks, Melanie, for reading that for us. It's a little bit of a lengthy text. Uh, before I get to that, I uh, just wanted to share a quick story with you to kind of open up the text there. So when I was about 12 or 13, my dad bought me my first guitar. Uh, this is not my first guitar. This, is, uh, this was my dad's guitar, though I inherited it when, uh, when, when he passed away in 2019. Uh, but he taught me how to play uh, when I was younger. And I always wanted to learn how to play because I grew up watching him play. And Dad was a, Dad was a pretty good guitarist. He was pretty good. He did the whole garage band thing when he was in college. He had the long hair down past his shoulders. Of course, I think everybody who's a Gen Xer had long hair to their shoulders. Randy, I expect to see pictures after this of you in the, in the 80s or, or the 70s. They're, they're online. I'm, everything's online, right? I'm, so I'm sure, especially nowadays, if you do something like that. But I grew up watching him. We, we would sit in the living room, and he would play Beatles music. Uh, he enjoyed Aerosmith. And, and so anyway, uh, we, we, would, we would enjoy uh, kind of playing these songs. He would make up songs. One of his, one of his famous songs is Kitty Cow, when I, was, when I was really young. I used to like listening to that. It's about... A kitty cow doesn't moo or doesn't mow. We, we don't know anyhow. But anyway, uh, I, I won't play that song for you. But I don't know if you knew this or not. There's actually two different ways to learn how to play guitar. There's the easy way and there's the hard way. Those are the two ways to learn how to play guitar. Which one would you like to learn? Which method of learning guitar would you like to hear about first? The hard, you want to learn the hard way. Okay. So here's how the hard way works. You, there's, there's about three or four simple steps. I'll see if I can remember them off the top of my head. The hard way to learn guitar is, number one, you, you purchase a guitar. Number two is you book some kind of venue, a gig. You, you book at a, at a coffee shop. You get people in front of you, you. You book your gig. You pick out your song, okay? Step three is you, 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 know, you pick out some nice clothes or whatever. You get on stage, and you have your songs picked out. You make sure you down a Red Bull before you get up. And then the last step is you try really hard. All right, you just, you just try really hard. You move your fingers around as fast as you can up and down the strings, right? You, uh, you sing as loud and passionately as you possibly can. You pour, you pour everything. You try, I mean, just channel your inner Eric Clapton. Just, just play as hard, play, try as hard as you can. I call that the hard way because it's impossible. <laughs> like nobody learns, how to, nobody learns how to do anything that way. You want to be a, an athlete. You want to be a, I mean, you want to be anything you are not going to learn that. That is the hard way. All right? Would you like to know the easy way? Okay. Well, one person does. I heard, I heard a, a kiddo say, yeah. So uh, if you want to learn to play guitar, here, here's the easy way to learn. Um, my dad taught me this way. He, he had a, a piece of paper that he had printed on. I was about 14 when I started strumming, so I, I took a couple of years to get started. So he, he printed out a sheet of paper, and it had, had six lines on it, representing the six lines on, on the guitar string. And then there was a circle with a one in it. That's for the index finger. There's a circle for the two, for the middle finger, a circle for a three, that's the ring finger. We didn't get to the, you know, fourth or using thumb or anything. Uh, so he, he handed me the, me the sheet of paper and he laid it down and I had to learn how to, you know, okay, a G, index finger here. And he sat down, oh, yep, yep, and do your middle finger there. That's how, yep, that's how you do it. And your ring finger there. Okay, now try strumming. And it, it okay. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take, you just embarrassed Bob up here, right? And it didn't sound like that. You know, it kind of, it, it, I, I had a lot of that stuff going on, that, that yucky sound. I don't know if people online can hear or not, but that was a bad sound. So uh, I, I did that. He said, okay, good. Now try the C. Here, okay, middle, ring finger, you know, ring finger here, index finger here, there. Okay, now strum. Okay, and again, it didn't sound that clean the first time. And same thing, same thing with the D. I put my fingers in the right space. I'm looking at the sheet. Good. And here's, here's what I said, okay you, okay, you got those three chords. He said, a lot of songs just have those three chords. So just, just learn those three chords. And here's what you need to do. Here's the easy way to learn guitar. He said, you need, to, you need to just in your bedroom every night for like an hour, every single day, practice those three chords over and over and over and over again. And so I learned the easy way. I, I went into my bedroom every night for, for at least an hour, sometimes longer, and I would look at that sheet. And for the first few days, I'm looking at the sheet, and I'm going back and forth, and do I have that right? Oh, that doesn't sound right. You know, and I'm, and I get, I'm getting more of those sounds, but eventually I'm able to look at the sheet and put my fingers in the right place and push down hard enough. My fingers are, like, hurting. They're bleeding. They're turning red. Yeah, you've been through this if you played uh, any stringed instrument, really. And so, uh, but, but eventually, eventually I'm, able to, I'm able to not look at the sheet, and now I'm able to just... I remember, you know, G goes here, then a C goes here, and it takes me a minute. And then after, after a few weeks, I was able to pretty quickly move from one to the other. 
kind of like that. But then eventually, after about a month, I didn't have to look, I didn't have to think, and now I'm to the point where I can go through all three and I can, I can talk to you, I'm not even thinking about it. It's just muscle memory. It's, it's become a part of who I am, right? So that's the easy way to learn how to play guitar. Now today, we're, I'm actually not going to give you a guitar lesson. I'm not qualified for that. But we're going to talk about the text today, which is about how to learn to be godly, which I guess I don't know if I'm qualified to do that either. <laughs> but we're going to talk about that today. How does one become godly? Now, in one of his books uh, that I appreciate a lot, John Orberg, he says that there's two ways to learn how to become godly. You probably know what they are. There's the hard way and there's the easy way. Once again, we'll start with the hard way. The hard way is try really hard, right? Wake up in the morning, look in the mirror and say, Nick Schatz, or say your name, first name, last name, you're going to be godly today. And just drink a Red Bull and try really hard to be godly. Now, I call that the hard way because it will not work. It will not work, especially not long term. You might be able to fake it. You might have a form of godliness, but you'll lack the power, right? You'll, you'll, you'll go through the motions, but, but you, you will not learn to be godly by just trying really hard. That's the hard way. But the easy way is just like the guitar there. You train yourself. You, you, have, you have disciplines in your life. You have habits that you form in your life that, that slowly lead you to, to do what you cannot do now. You have habits that lead you to the point where you can do them eventually, and you can train yourself to become godly. So what we're going to learn today from the text is that the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to a young minister, okay? He's writing a letter to a young minister, a young pastor named Timothy. And he's saying, hey, Timothy, the, the first thing that you need to know about being a good minister is that you need to train yourself to be godly. And what we're going to see is one of the key ways to train yourself to be godly is by digesting this book, digest and chew on and, 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 and nourish yourself is what the text says in verse 6. Nourish yourself on this book. And then once Timothy has been able to train himself to become godly and he's, and he's fed himself, nourished himself on this book, then he's able to be a good example to the others in his church. He's able to train the people in his church. He's able to prioritize the teaching and the preaching of God's word so that his church can also become a good and healthy church. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. If I had to put all this in a phrase, and I wrote it on a card here that I'm going to stick up here because it's important. Train yourself to be godly by digesting this book. If I, if I had to sum up the chapter, we're going to go through it. But I would say, train yourself to be godly by digesting this book. And that's what the text is talking about today. Now, I'm going to, again, Melanie read the whole thing. We don't need to go through it all. But we're going to pick up in verse 6. Verse 6 and 7 are key to this. If you want to highlight it, circle it, whatever you do in your Bibles. Okay, let's pick it up in verse number six. If you're using a pew Bible, I think it's page 830. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Jesus, of Christ Jesus. He wants them to be a good minister, a good pastor. Nourished, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with those things that are not good faith, right? Those things that are not in this book, the godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. Train yourself to be godly. Once again, Timothy, young pastor, train yourself to be godly. And you do that by digesting the words and the stories and the narratives and the history and the commands and, and the poetry that is in this book. Digest this book. Train yourself to be godly. And then he goes on later to say, then you will be able to be a good example to those around you in faith and purity and good deeds and so on and so forth. Train yourself to be godly. Train yourself to be godly by digesting this book. Now, this theme of training comes up elsewhere in Scripture. Let me just read a couple of uh, passages for you. So here's Hebrews 5.14. Solid food is for the mature who by constant, by constant use, by practicing the G and the C and the D, have trained themselves. You don't naturally distinguish between good and evil. You can train yourself to do that, though. Hebrews 12, 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but it's painful. We don't like discipline. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace to those who have been trained by it. The opposite is also too. In 2 Peter 2, 14, he writes about the unrighteous who have hearts that have been trained in greed. There, there are habits and patterns that you have in your life that may be training you to be unrighteous, right? You, you can train yourself one way or the other. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, this book, is inspired by God. It is God-breathed, and it is profitable. And he mentions some things, and he mentions for training in righteousness. We train ourselves in righteousness. Now, if you have a copy 
of your own Bible with you. If you don't, grab one in the pew. Now, there's only a couple per pew, so you may not have enough there in front of you. If you're watching at home and you have one uh, near you on on your bed or on your couch or maybe you're in a hotel room because you're on vacation, go ahead and grab that Bible and I want you to hold it up for a second. Go ahead and hold it up all around. If you're, I'm sorry, if you're using a smartphone or a tablet, you know, you don't have to feel it. You can hold that too, up too, okay? I see someone with a tablet over here. So this right here, this is the key. It's not the only thing, but it is the key for you growing to become godly, for you training yourself to become godly by digesting the words that are in this book. Train yourself to be godly by digesting, by nourishing yourself, feeding yourself on this book. Let's look at that text again, verse number six. He mentions being nourished in the truth of the faith and of good teaching. That comes from a related word uh, in Greek, which means to feed oneself. So to to feed yourself on this Bible, to eat this book, to, to digest, to chew on this, to swallow it, to allow it to nourish you, to feed on this book. Hershey Free, if you want to grow in godliness, read this book. Read it. Read it every single day. Find a podcast or an app. There's, there's, there's you know, several different kinds of apps out there that allow you to listen to it on an audiobook. Read this book. Listen to this book. If you have verses memorized or you can begin memorizing and, and quote this book to yourself, read this book. But don't just read it. Meditate on it and, 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 and think about it and, and, and process it. And uh, just, just let your mind dwell in it and, and sit with it. Meditate on this book. But, but don't, just, don't just read the book. Don't just meditate on the book. I mean, nourish yourself. Feed yourself on it. Uh, uh, digest this book. Allow it to work its way into your cells and into your body. Eat this book. This idea of nourishing ourselves on the Word of God, this idea of, of, of feeding ourselves on God's Word comes from elsewhere in Scripture. Here's one of the favorite, my favorite passages uh, on this topic. It's from Ezekiel. About 2,400 years ago, there was a priest named Ezekiel. Now, my understanding of the priestly office is that it was kind of mundane. You, you know, you wake up and you do the tabernacle stuff or the temple stuff. You do your sacrifice. It's kind of the same thing over and over and over again. One day, there was a priest about 2,400 years ago named Ezekiel. And his, his mundane, routine life was completely shaken because he received a word from God. He received a vision from God. I imagine, I don't know exactly how, but I imagine he fell into some kind of trance and the Lord spoke to him in, in, in a series of visions. And one of those visions was this. Look at uh, Ezekiel 2 verse 9. Ezekiel writes about this vision. He says, I looked and I saw a hand stretched out to me and in it was a scroll. And he unrolled the scroll before me. On both sides of it were written words of laments and mourning and woe. And he said to me, son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll and then go and speak to the people of Israel. Eat this scroll. Digest this book. Sit with, chew on the words of this book. Eat it. Eat this book. Around the same time period, another prophet named Jeremiah had a similar thing that he wrote. In Jeremiah 15, 16, he writes to the Lord, When your words came, I ate them. I ate them. I digested them. They were joy and my heart's delight. Eat them, digest them, consume them, devour the words of this book if you want to train yourself in godliness. This comes up at least one more time in Scripture. This is about 600 years after that. There was a man named the Apostle John. And John also received a vision from God. And, 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 and in this vision that he had, he, he must have been, again, asleep or something like that. And the Lord spoke to him in this dream. And in this dream, he heard the voice of God. It was like the voice of thunder, he said. You ever been around thunder that was close by and it just, it, it cracks and it, it rattles your chest and it, it shocks you when you hear it. It, it kind of makes you jump, right? And you, you can't fall asleep and the dog's barking and it, it just, it shakes you. It rattles the whole house, right? And he heard the voice of God and it sounded like thunder. And so he, he grabs a quill, he grabs a parchment, he's ready to write down and the voice of thunder says, stop, don't write this, don't write this. And instead, here's what he says. Here's what the voice says, this thundering voice. Revelation 10, verse 8. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go and take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who was standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel, John writes, and I asked him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And so John, he put down his pen or his quill, I guess, He put down his parchment and he picked up his fork and his knife and he ate the book. Digest this book. 
A book, uh, there's another book written by uh, uh, Eugene Peterson that I have here. It's, it's actually entitled Eat This Book, and it's based on this passage from John. And here's, here's what he writes on one of the pages. He says, Christians feed themselves on Scripture. Holy Scripture nourishes the holy community as food nourishes the human body. Christians don't simply learn or study or use Scripture. We assimilate it. We take it into our lives in such a way that it gets metabolized into acts of love into cups of cold water, into missions into all the world, healing and evangelism and justice in Jesus' name. That's that's how he describes this process of digesting the book. Hershey Free, church, don't just read this book. Don't just meditate on it, but but digest it. And and chew on it. Chew on the things. And and as you chew, process and try to understand what is happening in this book and what is happening within me. And as you chew it, taste the character of God that drips off of the pages of this book. And then swallow it down into your soul and allow it to work its way through your system. Allow it to work its way and, and digest. Digest the stories in here. Digest the history that's in here. Digest the commands that are in here, the visions that are in here, the poetry that is in here. Digest the words of this book and allow it to metabolize into your body so that it becomes the new, the new cells and it works its way into your blood system and it, it forms stronger bones and it forms muscles and it forms new cells and new thinking patterns in your brain and allow this book to become a part of you. Metabolize, digest, eat this book. Now, you'll also notice something, if you can put that verse back on the screen there from John, uh, uh, written by John from Revelation uh, 10, verse 8, or verse 9, I think it is. You'll notice at the very end here, take and eat it, you'll notice that it gives him a stomachache. Not everything in this book will agree with your system. You ever gone on a new diet? I won't go into detail, but for the first few days, you know, (laughs) it kind of messes with you. It messes with you. Here's something else that Peterson says. Sooner or later, we find that not everything is to our liking in this book. It starts out sweet to our taste, just like this verse, but when we find that it doesn't sit well with us at all, it becomes bitter in our stomachs. There are hard things in this book, hard things to hear, hard things to obey. There are words in this book that are difficult to digest, and John got a severe case of indigestion. And the same thing happened to Ezekiel. We didn't have time to read it. But if you go back to that passage in Ezekiel in chapter 3, after he finishes the vision, after he eats the scroll in his vision, he wakes up and he travels to Tel Aviv and he sits down with some of his friends. And for seven days he does nothing. He just sits in total shock and, and anger and confusion. He's, he's, he, 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 can't, he can barely move for seven days. It completely wrecks his system. This book, if you digest it, will wreck your system. But eventually it'll become a part of your cells. It'll become a part of your muscles. It'll become a part of your, blood, your bloodstream. It'll become a part of you. And like Peterson says, it'll begin to work its way out of you. Because you'll be trained in godliness from digesting this book. Train yourself to be godly by digesting this book. And after he tells Timothy to digest the book, here's what he says. Let's read on in verse number 13. Hebrews 4, 13, he, yeah, basically what we're going to see is he invites Timothy to orient, uh, reorient his entire ministry around this book. There, there are many things that a church does. There are many things that a, that a pastor and people in the congregation do and so forth, but, but it all, it lays at the foundation of this book. All of it is wrapped around the teaching and the doctrine and the understanding and the stories that are in this book. It's, it's all, it's engulfed in this book. Here's how, we, here's how he's to, to set up the ministry of the church. 1 Timothy 4, 13. Paul writes, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. Devote yourself to this. That's what we're to be devoted to, reading the book publicly? Just devote yourself to reading this book publicly, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given to you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. G, C, D, G, C, D. Be diligent. Give yourself wholly to them. So that everyone may see your progress, because as you digest, you will become more godly, and people will see your training, your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. If you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. Now, this was not a new practice. 
This was not a new thing that houses of worship were to be doing. In fact, this has been going on since, since the Bible was first recorded. Moses and his scribes were some of the first ones to record the words of God down. So it was not just oral, but it was actually recorded. And so here's what happens in Exodus 24. The Bible says that Moses, and we can apply, and his scribes, wrote down everything the Lord had said. And then he took the book of the covenant, and he read it to all the people. And they responded, we will do everything Yahweh has said. We will obey. Deuteronomy 31, once again, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God, you shall read this law before them in their hearing. Assemble the people, the men, the women, and the children so they can listen and learn to fear the Lord your God and follow carefully all the words of this law. After Moses died, this practice of of, of publicly reading Scripture continued because Joshua took over as the new leader of Israel. And here's what happens in Joshua 8, verse 30. There, in the presence of the Israelites... Joshua wrote on the stones a copy of the law of God. And Joshua read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curses, just as it is written in the book of the law. There was not a word, there was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read to the whole assembly of Israel. Even after Joshua was passed off the scene, we move into the history of Israel where kings are ruling over Israel. And one of the first things that a king was supposed to do when he takes his throne is he, he takes his own quill, his own parchment. He writes his own copy. He word by word copies himself, his own copy of the scripture. And here's what one of those uh, kings did. His name was Josiah. I'm in 2 Kings 23. Josiah went up to the temple of the Lord with the people. And all the people, from the least to the greatest, he read in their hearings all the words of the book of of the covenant. Later on, there's another scribe named Ezra who did the same thing. I'm reading from Nehemiah chapter 8. Ezra Ezra opened the book and all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, all the people stood and they instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so the people understood what was being read. That, by the way, is biblical preaching. Reading the scripture, making it clear and giving, the re- and giving the meaning. That is biblical preaching. That's what churches like ours and, and, all other, and churches all over the world, since the foundation of the church, have been doing every single Sunday, reading the scriptures, explaining what it means, and then applying it to the people. Reading it, making it clear, and then giving the meaning. This is biblical preaching. And this is, this is what the, all the ministry, all the ministry of the church is wrapped around this foundational thing, this book. Digest this book. Eat it. Chew it. Let it metabolize within you. Eat this book. The book's alive. It's living and it's active. Now we all know that books have have books can be powerful. Not just the Bible. Book books can be powerful. Books can start movements. They can start start thought patterns. They can they they can inspire people in different ways, for good or for bad. I mean, I think about. Karl Marx and the Communist Manifesto. Very influential book. Not for good, I would argue. 1984 by George Orwell. Mein Kampf by Hitler. Relativity by Albert Einstein. And we could, we could, all, list, we could all list dozens and dozens of books that have been incredibly influential that for good and for evil that have shaped the history of the world. None has shaped the history of the world like this book. It's because it's not just powerful. This book's alive. It's living, it's active, it it can pierce into your heart and it can change the person you are in a way that no other book can. It's alive. And if you digest it and let it nourish and and feed yourself on it and nourish yourself on it, it will change who you are. Train yourself to be godly by digesting this book. C.S. Lewis, he's the author who wrote the Chronicle of Narnia series uh, and if you haven't read the Chronicles of Narnia, come on, you got to read those books. They're, those are good books. One of his books is The Silver Chair. Here's a picture of the copy. And it's, uh, in, in this scene, uh, there's this girl named Jill, and she encounters a lion. And so here's a picture of the lion. And Jill's a little, a little scared. <laughs> uh, if you, if, again, if you haven't read Chronicles of Narnia, the, the lion, rep- uh, his name is Aslan. Uh, he is representative of Jesus Christ. And when he speaks, his words are, uh, they, they represent the word of God. They represent the words of God. And so he's speaking to Jill, and in this, in this passage in the silver chair, he tells Jill that he wants to send her on a mission. And her mission, should she choose to accept it, which she does accept, is to find the lost prince and to bring him back home. And so Jill is talking with the lion, and she says, but well, Aslan, how, how will I be able to find the prince? And how will I be able to bring him home? 
And he proceeds to give her four signs. The signs, of course, represent the word of God. Here's what Aslan says. Remember. Remember the signs. Say them to yourself when you wake up in the morning, when you lie down at night, and when you wake up in the middle of the night. And whatever strange things may happen to you, let nothing turn your mind from following the signs. I give you a warning. Here on the mountain, I have spoken to you clearly. I will not often do so down in Narnia. But here on the mountain, the air is clear and your mind is clear. As you drop down into Narnia, the air will thicken. Take great care that it does not confuse your mind. Remember the signs and believe the signs. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. Remember the signs. Remember the signs. Nothing else matters. Now I want to pause for a second, and I want to speak to, to, to any, any skeptic that may be listening to me. I, I believe there's, there's somebody who's listening to me who's a little skeptical, all right? Maybe you would say, I'm not sure if I'm a Christian, or, or I used to be a Christian, I walked away from that, or I've, I've never, I'm, I'm not a Christian, but someone invited me to listen, they sent me a link, so I'm listening, so maybe you're listening online, and, but, but you're a little skeptical. You say, look, I, I, respect, I respect Jesus, I've heard enough about him, I've read articles about him, I've read some of the words that you know, other people have claimed he said that he wrote down and, you know, they're in red or whatever in, in, in this book. I've, so I, I have respect for Jesus and his teachings and the things that he said. Turn the other cheek. I, it's beautiful. I, I respect Jesus. I, I, maybe you would even say, I respect this book. It's, it's, it's changed a lot of people. It's shaped culture. It's a lot of good has come from this book and from the organization that we call the church. You know, not all of it good, but I, listen, I respect all this stuff. And, but maybe you're listening and you would say, I don't know about calling it alive. <laughs> that seems like a stretch. I don't know if I would say that it's like the word of God or, I, you know, that just seems like a stretch. And, and that's a fair point, okay? If, you, if you're skeptical and you're listening to me, it's a fair point. I haven't necessarily provided proof of that, so I understand that. But I would also want to encourage you, if you're a skeptic, to also try reading and meditating and digesting this book. Arguably, no other book in human history has shaped world history like this book. Now, uh, now you, there are other books that have as well. I, I realize that, but, but arguably so. This is at least in the top five, okay? I would argue it's the top, but at least in the top five that has shaped human history. In fact, I want to read to you a quote from, from, from a Hindu man, someone who, who does not worship the Christian God, someone, someone who, uh, to my knowledge, did not believe that this was authoritatively the word of God or inspired by God. Here's, here's what a Hindu man said. His name was Gandhi. He writes, you Christians look after a document containing enough dynamite to blow all civilization to pieces, to turn the world upside down and bring peace to a battle-torn planet. But you treat it as though it is nothing more than a piece of literature. If you're skeptical, I just want to challenge you with this. If, if you're skeptical, you know, I'm not a Christian, I don't know, I would challenge you to read this book I mean, Gandhi here, not a, not a Christian, a Hindu man, he says that it, it's, it has dynamite power in it, that it can turn the world upside down. That makes me want to read it, you know? If you say that about any book, I want to read that book, right? I would challenge you to read this book. Now, I think most of my audience, you would, you, you come here week after week, but most of you, you, maybe you would say you are a Christian. You do identify as a Christian. I want us to be challenged by something this Hindu man says. Don't look after it like it's a document, don't read it for information or just history lessons or, oh, that's interesting. Don't, don't read it to be interested. Treat it like it can turn the world upside down. And, and I would challenge us to, to read it and meditate on it and, and digest, eat the book and allow it to work its way into our bloodstream and into our system so that it can change us and who we are. Train yourself to be godly by digesting this book. Let me pray for us. Father, we believe that your word is living and active and that it's able to pierce the heart, that it's able to transform us into the likeness of your son Jesus. I want to pray for, for our church, for Hershey Free, as they begin their training or continue their training in godliness by, by digesting this and nourishing themselves and feeding themselves on this book. I pray that you would transform them into the likeness of Jesus Christ as they work this into their system. 
Father, I also want to pray for anyone who's listening that, that is not a believer, who's, who's skeptical, but uh, Father, I'm just blown away that if anybody is, is listening that, that is a skeptic, I'm just blown away that they were so gracious to spend 30 minutes or 20 minutes or so listening to me teach on this book. I'm just blown away by that generosity. But I pray that you would guide them and challenge them to explore this book and to explore Christianity as they also chew on the words of this book. We pray this to you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.